Everybody ready? Ready? Yeah. All right. Listen. It's your weekend show. Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. With Bob Bierman. It's great. Is it just me, or do you ever wake up in the morning and wonder if this entire world has gone collectively and suddenly insane? I can admit there are many times over the past several years that I have I've increasingly become to believe that. I, I go back 10, 20, 30 years ago, and I've watched some things happen in this country and where I live in the United States and I I see across the border into the things happening in Canada and in Western Europe and I wonder have we truly advanced as a species is the human race a race determined to crash and burn or is there any hope left I had a hard time falling to sleep the other night as I was kind of thinking about what to share on the radio program today and this is your weekend show and I'm your host Bob Bierman and I'm so glad you are taking some time to listen to me today but I had one of those nights where I kept tossing and turning and I'm trying to to reconcile in my mind two things how is it that we as human beings have have learned to split the atom put a man on the moon build these devices that fit in our pockets, these incredible, powerful machines we call a smartphone that can play video, that can make telephone calls, that can double as a calculator, that can get us online. The computing power of these things is enormous. In fact, when you think about it, there is more computing power in my little cell phone, in my pocket right now, than they use to take man from Earth and send him into space to the moon and back. The computing power of your cell phone is incredibly more powerful than all those mega million dollar computers designed in the 50s and 60s to get man on the moon in 1969. How did we get to that point in 1969 to have that kind of understanding and that kind of technology? If you were to go back a hundred years before 1969, there were no radios, there were no televisions, there were no vacuum tubes, there were no transistors, there was nothing. We were still cooking and heating with essentially fire or coal. We lived in an agrarian society. For the most part, in 1869, what manufacturing plants we had oftentimes use the power of a nearby stream or river to run their machines. Our most advanced motor was a steam engine, and it would be several years before we even began to understand the power of electricity and the first electric motors. It was well into the beginning of the 20th century before we started to even understand the concept of a radio wave. It was in the 1800s we went from a telegraph to a very simple telephone. And then from the telephone, we had the motion picture. We had the ability of recording sound for the first time in a very mechanical way. And look how far we've progressed in literally a lifetime for many I think of my my grandparents, for example. They were born right around the turn of the 20th century in the very early 1900s. And their world was kerosene lanterns. Their world was very different than the world we know today. But electricity was making its debut around the turn of the century in many areas. The telephone was becoming increasingly a useful tool. And by the time they were in their 20s, you had the first radio stations broadcasting. So in the first 20 some odd years of their life, they went from kerosene lamps to radio sets and light bulbs. And then again, within another 10 or 15 years, you had radio sets with 
amplifiers and beautiful cabinets, and you could hear people from all over the world coming into your radio set. And it wasn't long after, before they even got into their 50s, we had television. Matter of fact, they were probably at that time in their early 40s when television rolled around and came online in New York City in 1948. Then I look at my lifetime. I'm born in the early 50s. And I I think to myself, we went from black and white TV to color TV to the kind of digital TV we have today. We've gone in many areas from two or three stations with the advent of cable and satellite to hundreds, hundreds of digital TV stations available at the touch of a button. Automobile technology has radically changed in the past, oh, let's say 30 years. I can remember when I first started driving and my first car. You always worried about a car when it got past around 75 or 80,000 miles because it's going to become very troublesome and probably heading for the scrap heat when it finally turns over 100,000. And now with computer technology to, to help monitor and get best performance out of engines and and higher tolerances for building these engines getting two to three hundred thousand miles is no longer uncommon for an automobile so there have been so many advances so how do we advance so much as a species in our technology how can we be so intelligent to to understand how we split the atom, which we cannot see even under a microscope. How do we know that particles can be accelerated? How do we understand these concepts? How did we gain all this incredible knowledge of this world around us? And we begin to discover things that we never, never could dream of just a few decades before. What were once theories in the minds of many are now realities that we take for granted every day. And so as intelligent as we are, the ability we have to produce food in the Western world, yeah, we can, we feed nations. We have grocery stores. We have communications. We have indoor plumbing, we have heating, we have air conditioning in so much of the Western world. We have so much knowledge at our fingertips. So why, so why do we have the strange things and behavior that occur in the world today? If we are so advanced, if we are so intelligent, if we are so creative that we can do all these marvelous things and have done it in literally a hundred years' time. You know, a hundred years ago, the biggest threat we faced was entering World War I. Doughboys with rifles and the first use of chemical warfare. There were no radio sets to communicate. We didn't have the technology we have today. Aviation was just the beginnings of biplanes. And look how rapidly that changed from the first little biplanes flying over Europe during World War I to the flying fortresses that we had like 20 to 25 years later, thousands of them serving in World War II and really beginning to understand the concept of aviation and how those monstrous machines were replaced by by planes and aircraft far greater in capacity and speed in, in a short amount of time and even breaking the sound barrier. How can we as a species accomplish so many things in our scientific world And watch our understanding of life disintegrate before our very eyes. I was thinking the other day what it was like when when I went to high school. That's a long time ago. And what the expectations were back in high school. And I I look at the Western world today and, and 
so many students are graduating out of high schools with no knowledge of history. They couldn't tell you anything of any substance about current events. But they can tell you about video games. They can they can tell you about certain pop stars and movies. And they have a hard time putting together a proper sentence and doing simple math. I, I have to wonder, how are we going to sustain all this technology when there is this kind of a dumbing down effect on kids coming out of schools? You know, I get people mad when I say this, and I'm going to say it anyway, because it's simply true. Today, in too many parts of the world, the United States included, our public school systems are becoming more like indoctrination and brainwashing centers. Any try, any kind of morality you try to instill and teach at home is dismissed and laughed at as, as fables and, and unhealthy The way you try to raise your children, the schools act like they own your children and they will do with your children what they deem in their best interest. And the parents, well, you're just there to pay for it all and let them do what they do. I look at a world today of young people that are craving tattoos and body piercings, and it's become almost an obsession I see people today that are literally covered in tattoos on their arms, their backs, their faces, their entire bodies. And I have to wonder to myself, why do you do this to yourself? Why do you shove metal into your face and over and near your eyes and and the wrists that that are entailed? Today, many of our young people find themselves protesting. And oftentimes, I don't even think they understand what they are protesting about. Now, I'm not trying to pay my generation or the one just ahead of me some big compliment that we were so much smarter, though I think that we were in many ways. Did we have protest in our days? Did we use our American First Amendment rights from time to time? Of course we did. But the causes whether you agreed with them or not, at least made sense and you could understand and delineate the two different sides of an argument. Whether you agreed with it or not, we could talk about it. Here's what's changed today, and here's what really is getting under my skin. Those that are determined to eviscerate any kind of morality, any kind of godliness, any kind of value that means personal responsibility. You are silenced. They don't even want to hear you. They'll shout you down. There was a time that you could have a debate and hear both sides of an issue. Those now on the left want to shut you down. They want to shout you off the stage. They want to brand you a hater, a racist, whatever name they can come up with today. That term gets so overused, it now has become, at least to me, utterly meaningless. And the things that people protest about, the things that people march for today, also, also make no sense. And so as I thought the other night, as I'm laying there in bed, trying to get a handle around this world that we live in today, and I'm trying to understand these groups like the Antifa groups, these supposedly anti-fascists, but they're the most fascist of any fascists that ever walked the face of the earth. The Bible reminds us of this one absolutely solid truth. And it is so plainly evident to those who have the eyes open to see it. They have been given over given over to a reprobate mind. They, they no longer have the ability of clear rationality. No longer is two plus three equal five. It equals whatever you want it to equal today. It doesn't matter. There is no absolutes in their world. In other words, they can change 
their opinions and their feelings on a dime. And the world is supposed to revolve around feelings, not reality. We raise children now more and more in this virtual world, and they are having a difficult time. Many, many young people are having a difficult time facing the realities of life. They believe that life simply owes them everything, a roof over their head, food on the table, a smartphone and a video game. These are entitlements now. They're not something that you work for and earn and do your part. People expect to mark the milestones in their life with great celebration, though they have no accomplishment to celebrate. This is the world that we live in today, the seeds of which were sown many, many years ago. I saw an interesting news story, and I'm trying to remember what city it came from. I believe it came from University of California at Berkeley. And there were students taking a test, and some of these students were protesting. They thought the test was unfair, and they shouldn't have to take a test. They should be given more time. They should get this and that and the other, and they were interrupting those trying to take a test. They felt entitled. You know, I paid for this education. Just give me the degree. Why should I have to take a test to prove I know something? I've been here. I attended occasionally. I bought my degree. I'm entitled. For years, our public schools in many of the inner cities in the United States were the social and economic climate was not good. Kept passing students and just promoting them, though they couldn't read or write. You have people that go to college today that have to take basic elementary school writing classes to get started in college because they can't do it. Yet they've got a diploma, which means nothing. And we wonder how we're going to survive You know, back when I was growing up, the great occupational idea was, you know, to be like a fireman or an airline pilot or or whatever. Just, you know, all the things you go through as a kid. Today, it's going to be, I'm going to make video games. And they know nothing about the underlying technology and code that makes it happen. We are setting ourselves up to be dependent. You know, the Internet is a good thing, and I've talked about it before, but... Our dependency on it can also be very dangerous. I lived for the past month without internet service at home and no cell service. And it was actually a good time to break away from television and break away from the usual stuff you find. Uh, You didn't see it that much, and I learned to live a lot without it. And even now that it's restored, the amount of time I'm, I'm spending using it has been severely diminished from what it had been not that long ago. And I'm finding myself a better person for it. I'm finding that, you know, when you expose your mind to the sewage of the world, it's not a good thing. We have Christians today, Christians that occasionally go to church. They find that such a chore. Oh, it's just so hard to get up on Sunday. Oh, I got to do this with the kids and I don't want the aggravation. We have 168 hours in the week. If you can't find one hour for God, you do not have God. You just don't. You think you do, but you do not know him, and he does not know you. Let me make that clear. If you can get up on a Sunday morning and decide, you know, I think I'm going to go to the beach or I'm going to go to the mountains, and you stop going, God no longer knows you, and you do not know him. And don't go under this false notion that you are somehow, when you die, just going to automatically go to heaven. You'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and hear him say, I never knew you. Depart from me. And we raise our kids that way with this attitude that it's not important. It's only secondary. We have kids that spend upwards of 60 and 70 and 80 hours a week in front of a video game. Literally, hooked to a device. And they will stomp their feet 
and say, no, I don't want to go to church. No, I want my video game. They're addicted. And you've allowed it to happen in your own homes. Parents are so irresponsible in giving some of these devices to these kids. And we wonder why they become psychological basket cases. We live in a world of the retrobate, the retrobate mind. It cannot discern right from wrong. It cannot see logic. It cannot understand two plus three equals five. It's all about feelings. You know, we go back to that spirit, and it's a very evil spirit that goes back, literally, for many, many decades. It started in the 1960s. If it feels good, do it. Make love, not war. We started sowing the seeds of our own destruction by never outgrowing the childishness that developed in the 1960s. And we allow our children, we allow our precious children to be in eternal peril because of our own selfishness. The Bible says we are to train up a child in the way that he or she should go. And so many parents today are dismal failures because of their own sins, because of their own doings. You have children that are not being properly raised and instructed in the fear of the Lord. Instead, they run the show And they live in their virtual world, a virtual world without Christ. Yeah, I'm a little upset today at the beginning of this program. I'm watching the world around me going into a self-destruction mode. I'm seeing things happen that I cannot begin to comprehend. When did gender become such a confused thing? Are we supposed to believe that 10, 20, 30% of the population doesn't understand their gender? This, how can I describe it? I believe the demonic powers of hell have entered into the minds of so many that are without Christ and they, they let this sewage come into their homes on their television sets and their smartphones and these things become more important. There there are people that are churchgoers that spend more hours per week in the United States watching trash like Jerry Springer, and then they find it too difficult to go to church. Turn Jerry Springer off. That is sewage for the brain. Get rid of it. Get it out of your house. You don't need it. You don't want it. No good Christian should allow that filth and trash into their house because you're giving a gateway to the demons of hell into your own mind. When you do, yes, I'm very upset. I think I have a right to be. I'm watching our nation being torn apart. We have athletes that make millions of dollars. They're supposed to gain all this respect. Of course, as a group, they have the highest percentage of felonies among their their team members compared to the rest of society. These are no longer role models. And so they're silly protests. They don't even understand what they're protesting because their minds are clouded. I've given up on things like the NFL. It's a waste of your time. Multi-millionaire felons for a lot of them, not all of them, but there's as a group, as a group, they're not a healthy group. This is what we want to look up to. Our priorities are all wrong. It's got to change. I know I've talked for a long time, and I know that I've almost been on a rant and rave here, but it has been on my heart and mind for several days to to talk about this. How can we claim to be so intelligent, so advanced, and yet so morally destroyed? How can we let this happen? And how far can it go? You know, the things I've seen in the last just 10 years, I would never have believed 10 years ago. The things that could happen 
are unbelievable to me today. But you know, five or six years from now, it'll become normal in this country. I think some of the things that if we thought about it 30 years ago, the impossibility that man could debase himself as much as mankind has. We never believed it was possible, but it really is. You know, someone asked me, and I told you last week, I shared this thought about, quote, the tribulation. When you see the shooting incident about two weeks ago in Las Vegas, and you see some of the other things in the world, and someone said, is this the tribulation? I said, no, not really. If you lived in the dark ages and watched a third of your population in a short time or more die a horrible death called the plague, you would have sworn you were in the Great Tribulation then. If you lived in Eastern Europe in the 1940s as the Germans took over your town and took people away and killed them, You would have thought you were in the Great Tribulation then. You can find points like that all over history. Go go back to the eight or nine hundreds when hordes of people came out of the Middle East trying to take over Europe. Yeah, my friend, I'm telling you, the time is coming and the time is coming soon that All manner of sin will be celebrated. I see it now even in some so-called churches celebrating sin instead of speaking against it and calling people to repentance. We no longer care about things like repentance. We no longer care because we think we have advanced ourselves because we have a smartphone. We now no more than God. God help us. This is your weekend show, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman. If you want to find out more about this program, why not visit our website, yourweekendshow.com. That's yourweekendshow.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Your Weekend Show. That's Your Weekend Show. My heart aches for my country. North America and all of Western Europe and the Western world as they were given so much and they are just squandering it for all the wrong purposes. It's something we're going to have to deal with, my friend. And I think the day of reckoning is already here. Built on the rock, the church shall stand Even when steeples are falling Crumbled have spires in every land Bells still are chiming and calling Calling the young and old to rest But above all the soul distressed Longing for rest everlasting God's house of living stones Built for His own habitation He through baptismal grace of songs Heirs of His wondrous salvation Were we but to His name to tell Yet He would deign with us to dwell With all His grace and His faith Sacrifice 
The real truth is that, that God will not be mocked. His church will stand, even if it's a remnant church. His church will still be victorious. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, St. Paul is writing to Timothy, young evangelist, young preacher of the gospel. And Paul knows the kind of difficulties that he's going through in his ministry. And this is what he writes you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Let me explain what that means. In season, out of season. There are times when preaching a message is easy. You have a very comfortable audience that is in agreement with the things you're saying. But sometimes you end up preaching out of season where the things that the Lord has placed upon your heart you know are going to be difficult for the people to hear. They're not going to want to hear it. He says to Timothy to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And here's what I want you to catch on to right now. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting or desiring to have their ears tickled. In other words, they want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear what God has to say because their emotions and their opinions now are more important than that of the Creator. And they will accumulate for themselves teachers, and I'll add to this word, in the meaning from scripture, their own set of preachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and they will turn to myths. But you, talking to Timothy, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Look, I know there are times that I get on a program like this, the way I'm doing it this weekend, that it's not, quote, what I like to call the happy gospel, where everything is good and everybody is just fine. And, and it's all about love and peace and happiness and everything's wonderful. And we all get along and, and we don't worry about sin. That's somebody's personal behavior. But God loves us all anyway. And we just celebrate that sin now. You know, I can think of mainline Protestant churches in the United States, Canada, England, and all over Europe that have walked away from the truth. They have basically thrown the Bible away and replaced it with what they want to hear. It's the popular cultural thing to do. We talked last week about what I call the cultural Christian, the most dangerous thing to the church today. They were raised in a church, and so they assume they have all the benefits, but none of the obligation, responsibility. No, they, they don't do any of that. They live their life for themselves. I tell you, St. Paul writes again, and he continues to Timothy, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Like I said before earlier, we have these cultural Christians that seldom if ever find themselves to a place of worship. They don't pray. They don't think about the things of God. They think about the things of the world. And a lot of these people have a very negative outlook on life because they've simply taken the one that can redeem us, sustain us, and bring us through our trials have pushed him out of the equation. And we look to psychologists only. We look to reality television shows and we find, we wonder why we're so depressed. Something else the scripture has to say, and I, I think St. Paul addresses this when he writes to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, 
Now, I'm talking, this really fits so many churches today that have just abandoned the truth of the Scripture. They have decided that they know better. Hey, we split the atom. We sent man to the moon. We built smartphones, God, so listen to us. You know, they decided not to retain that knowledge of God, as St. Paul writes. And what does the Scripture say? God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they will do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossipers, slanderers, God-haters. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there that are very proud to be in the public eye with their Facebook page, on, on their YouTube channel, whatever the case may be, openly hating and mocking God. The Bible also says God will not be mocked. They are insolent, they're arrogant, and boastful. Sounds like some of the protesters we see today in Antifa. I'll tell you what, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love. And let me just define that even better. Let's say no real love. Let's bring the translation a little closer. They they have a warped and misinformed interpretation of what they think is love, and it really is nothing more than lust. So they have no true love. They have no mercy. And all they know that God's righteous decree that those who do things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but approve of those who practice them. You know, I look at this world today. I look at news stories each and every week that come across my desk, across my news feeds. And I keep saying, Lord, can this get any worse? And you know something? It does. And to be honest, I expect it to keep getting worse. In the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, for so many years, we had all the benefits of the gospel of Jesus Christ people would gather on a Sunday to worship. They got together and repented of their sins. In times of terrible trial, the nation went to prayer. But now, those things are unacceptable. And a lot of people have found it disconvenient not to go to a church. And what's going to happen over time? The church will be declared by those that hate God, to be hate speech. And gradually what you can preach about is being diminished and being regulated by law of what you can and cannot say in your pulpit. There are many pastors that have already felt the wrath of that and in our world today expect it to continue to increase. Last week I preached a message to my congregation at the the chapel of Sky Valley. I call the message stealing from the vineyard. And it really has a lot to say about what I've just been talking about. And I want to share that message with you right now. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time that we hear from your word, open our eyes that we may see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. I don't know about you, but rainy days are sometimes hard days to get functioning. Today was one of them. And because I'm still living at a bit of a distance and have to travel through windy roads everywhere I go, it makes it even a slower going. But I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful for those of you that came here today to be here on this rainy day affected by the fourth hurricane to hit U.S. soil, Nate. So here we are in an unusual season, but really not that unusual. Go back over 150 years. There have been years like it. We've been due. We've had a lot of years without a hit, so I guess the odds finally get us there. You know, today I've been thinking, how do I tie these lessons together? The simple understanding of these lessons going in the Old Testament, the epistle lesson for day, and the gospel 
is essentially, essentially about how God's love and redemption is open to all. Remember in the Old Testament, the, prop, the, the prophecy is given to God's people. The promise of a Messiah, a Savior, is given to God's chosen people. But they rejected him. They rejected him. Nope, you're not the kind of Messiah we want. We want a different kind of Messiah. We have our own thinking of what you should be and how you should do it. And if you don't do it our way, go away. What the message today is on the surface, and there's a little bit of depth to it, and I finally came to that realization in the wee hours of this morning. The redemptive power of Jesus Christ is available to all those who claim upon his name. Just like in that parable that Jesus shared about the vineyard. And he had the tenants. And and in essence, if you understand the word tenants, these tenants were not paying him. They were being paid to tend to his vineyard. And when the time of harvest came, and he wanted what belonged to him for what he had given them, they rejected They even killed his very own son. Sound familiar to the passion story? I've always been amazed when I go through the passion story every year in what we call Holy Week, that time that begins on uh, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and all the excitement and before the week is out, he's dead crucify him they killed the son who bought the message St. Paul in this epistle kind of diverts just a little bit he reminds those who are reading his letter that I started out as one of the chosen ones I was one of the Pharisees I was one of the learned ones I was I was the ultimate Israelite I had it all. I even persecuted the church. Yet on that road one day, God took him off his high horse and his eyes became blinded so they could be open to the reality of the truth of God and his light. And St. Paul suddenly realized that the Redeemer was not just for a chosen group that are our example, but it's open to all. So where, where does this take us today? Does the message just end right here that Jesus now is open to all that want to receive of him? There's actually a message, I believe, in all of my heart to the church. A message I believe the church needs to take to heart. Now that we have been grafted into this tree of life. How many have heard that term that we as Gentiles are grafted into this tree of life? We're made a part of this, as Jesus says, grafted. St. Paul used that term. We are a part of that living tree of life. We now have a new responsibility because, see, we now have been given the gospel message. We now have been given this gift of life in Jesus Christ. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus Christ. The bloody shed at Calvary is shed for all. But just like the children of Israel, how many of us that have called or claim the name of Christ, just like the Jews claim the identity of the children of Israel, that they were the chosen, how many of those that claim the name of Christ are really showing the fruits of Jesus Christ in their life? 
there are so many, and I, I'm going to be careful in choosing my words. I don't even want to be perceived even the slightest bit political. Understand that. When we have a tragedy like occurred a week ago in Las Vegas, all of a sudden, everybody talks about those that have died and are all in heaven. How do we know that? We don't. We don't. But there's that broad brush assumption, oh, they died innocently, so they're all... Let me tell you something. We don't know how many days, hours, weeks, months, or years we may have left to live on this earth. And so many people live for themselves when they know in their heart if they're going to call upon the name of Christ and they're going to claim all the benefits of his passion, shouldn't they live for Jesus Christ? I know so many people that, as the Bible says, there's no fruit. There's nothing there. One of the scariest things I read in the Scripture is on that day, there are those who are going to stand before Jesus Christ and talk about all the great things they did in his name, supposedly. Well, you know, we cast out demons. We did this, we did that, we did the other. And Jesus himself will look at them and say, I never knew you. Who are you? Depart from me. Several weeks ago on the radio show that I do internationally, I shared this, this concept with my audience of the cultural Christian. It is uniquely a very Western church thing, cultural Christianity. It is the most dangerous thing in the church today. I'd rather be in the church persecuted in North Korea than be subjected to the damage that is being done by cultural Christianity. It's cultural Christianity that makes the broad assumption that everybody goes to heaven when they die. No matter how they live their life, everybody goes. Everybody's going to get it for free. And we can do whatever we want during the walking of this life. Anything with impunity. Because we're culturally Christians. I think I've shared this story with this congregation. I know I did not long ago with another audience. As some of you may know, I spent several years when I was in the west coast of Florida as a hospice chaplain. And I had one, I had a number of very unique experiences I could share with you of some great people that I met along the final part of their journey. And most that I would meet you know, we would talk about life, perspective, and the reason they called me is they wanted to make sure that they had everything, quote, together. They wanted the reassurance, and I, it was not easy. I did way too many funerals in the course of two years, about an average of one a week for people I barely knew. But there were two cases that stand in my mind, and I'm going to share them very quickly. The first case... I got called in. I was actually at the hospice house at the regular Tuesday morning meeting in the executive room where they talk about patients, you know, those that are coming on board, those that have passed away, those whose health has improved and they no, no longer need our services. And there was a knock at the door. And one of the nurses asked, could you come, can I borrow, you know, pastor over there? I need him really bad. And I'm wearing my collar and everything else. And I said, sure, what do you need? She said, come on, I'll explain. So we're walking toward this room, toward the hospice house. And she said, we have a family at war in there. I said, what's the situation? 36-year-old female in a coma, last stage, brain cancer. She's going to die. And the family's at war, and I don't know what to do. And so I quietly walked into the room. 
And I said, can I, can I have you gather with me outside on, on the patio? It's a beautiful day in Florida, and you have these big French doors. And, of course, they see the collar. Mm, okay. And they come and follow me outside, and I close the door. And I looked at him, what is wrong with you people? Why are you yelling and getting upset and crying? She may be in a coma, but she might be hearing every word you are saying and cannot respond. What is the problem? And the mother goes, you know, we used to be a church-going family, and when she came along, this is 30-some-odd years ago, We should have had her baptized. We just never got around to it. Sunday was always too important to do other things, picnics, football season, all the things you can imagine. Suddenly church was unimportant, and they never really raised their daughter in the faith. And now she she got married, she's got kids, and she's never really been in the faith. And the mother's blaming herself that my child may go to hell because I was irresponsible. And she was devastated. If only she could be baptized. I said, I can handle that right now. Not a problem. So I went out to my car, got all my stuff that I keep. Called the kitchen, asked for some fine china. You know, a fine bowl with water warm. (coughs) A little bit of salt. And I did the, you know, baptism right there in the bed. And then I anointed her with oil on my finger in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost she came out of her coma I mean out of her coma up in bed and I said do you know what just happened she was still groggy she goes I was just baptized I know it and I know something has changed for me the Lord gave her 48 hours to get right with him, right with her parents, and lead her children on the correct path in life. I did her funeral five days later. What a service. 300 people in attendance, over 100 came to know the Lord because of her testimony. Now, the other patient, I know I'm going a little long today, He came along around the same time. This guy, this guy lived, I think it was in Illinois, initially. He had gotten married at a young age, was a career kind of guy. And by golly, I'm going to retire to Florida by the time I am 55 years old with money in the bank, the biggest house, the nice boat, a golf membership. So I'm going to work really, really, really hard long hours and I'm going to save every penny we can they had a few children along the way that during all the years of their upbringing he never had time for them never had time for his wife his family always working the mother would take the children to church he would never go he was busy even on Sunday golfing and trying to get business deals put together on Sunday and then maybe he'd be getting home late and working all the long hours They did without for ages. And finally, as he got into his 50s, they had seven figures in the bank. Seven figures in the bank and growing. And he got to the point that he decided we're going to sell the house here and we're moving to, I guess the area is like Nokomis, Florida, just south of uh, Sarasota, north of Venice. Beautiful community, brand new home. Just breathtaking. And I'm called out there because he's only been there three months and he's been diagnosed with with cancer and he only has days to live. And I get there and I'm assuming I'm there to see the patient. No, it was the wife that called, wanted to talk to me. She said, you know, I'm feeling no emotion about his dying in the other room. He doesn't want to see you. He hates God, never loved God, will never love God. Doesn't believe there is a God. He's God, and he's mad at himself that he can't fix this. She said, I just feel terrible that I'm not feeling what I should feel for the man that I married. 
And I told her, I said, don't be so hard on yourself. He was never there. He was never there. And the children had the same feeling. It's like, so what? We don't even know who this guy is. It's funny. All those years, all the things he should have been doing with his life, he did none of them. And when he finally got to that point where he could have it all, he didn't have any of it. I do know in my follow-up about a year later how much better the wife and the children were doing. They were enjoying the inheritance and living a good life for themselves. We have a responsibility. We have been given a gift that is priceless, yet we treat it like it's trash at times. There's a hymn we sing oftentimes as we get toward Lent. You know, Jesus, priceless treasure. Jesus, a priceless treasure. Truest friend to me. Do you really know him? Is he truly the Lord of your life? Does he come first? Or do you think you own the vineyard? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time to to be in your word. And I pray that the words that I have shared today will reach people not just in this church building here, but across a large area. Father, I pray for the empowerment of your word in each of our hearts, that we may live the life that you have called us to live. Let us learn to honor and respect you and love you in all things. Father, we ask forgiveness for those times that we have failed you, those times that we have not listened or obeyed you. Lord, we take that forgiveness. We understand repent means to turn away from. For those of us that have not put you first in our lives, let us turn today and make you first. For in doing that, we are assured, we are assured of all your blessings, your love and your salvation. For this we ask in Jesus' name. And all the congregation said, Amen and Amen. Wow, where did this hour go? Another weekend is behind us here on Your Weekend Show. Hey, visit our website, yourweekendshow.com, or on Facebook, look for Your Weekend Show. This is Bob Bierman, wishing God's greatest blessings upon you, and see you next week.